So welcome everybody to this first of uh, what we perceive to be many events um, on the topic of Internet of Things. And so you can see that we, we call this uh, Beyond the Business Case. Um, and we, we know that there's a lot of IoT out there, um, but we also know that a lot of people are wondering what can be done with IoT. And you might be in different stages of implementation or uh, exploration or discovery. And so each of you was really personally invited to this meeting. And so it's kind of special in that sense. And even though this is the Global Center for Health Innovation, it is not just healthcare. There are some healthcare people here, but there's also some retail people here, manufacturing, banking. So we're going to explore IoT solutions cross industry in a sense, because as you know, other industries are doing in interesting things that you can look at that and you can learn from that and vice versa. So um, the thought is here that we're gonna stimulate some thinking uh, uh, from maybe other industries or other ways of implementing IoT that maybe you hadn't thought of before uh, because of the vertical uh, that you're in. So again, welcome and, uh, and, and thank you for coming. Uh, it's very appreciative, um, uh, all, all the vendors that are here. Um, very much appreciate your presence. If you haven't been on the wireless yet, uh, the wireless for our event is IOT event. The password is exactly the same uh, in, in all caps there. So the agenda. We're going to first hear, you know, the, the title of this was really beyond the business case. Um, but in order to ground us all, um, we're going to have a, a keynote speech by Vernon Turner. Uh, and then after that, we're going to have a, a lunch. Lunch is going to be just served right outside. Uh, we'll go have a nice lunch. You can bring it back in and uh, mingle for a couple minutes, and then we'll restart the, um, the afternoon session, which is a uh, panel of experts. And then there'll be some time for Q&A. So uh, we're going to keep this interactive, very open, um, and very engaging uh, in that sense. So uh, I want to thank really the vendors that made this possible uh, to have this event today, um, to provide the facilities, uh, the catering, et cetera. Uh, Tech Data is one of those uh, great companies that uh, you know the world's largest distributors of technology products. Dell EMC is also represented here, uh, and they're very uh, much moving forward with. Um, making IoT real and um, you know, with their devices. And you can see some uh, Dell equipment in the back of the room there. Please do visit the, uh, the equipment back there. VMware also with the IoT solutions to simplify the reliability and, uh, of the infrastructure. Logisync, uh, which is uh, based on the west side, uh, system solutions to innovative technology. Avantia who is also here today, and uh, they build software to improve uh, your business. And SmartShape, which is actually a company in the Global Center here, which helps companies uh, grow with uh, innovation. So those are the six vendors that are represented uh, here today. And you can see that, um, and you'll see this today during the presentations in the panel, that it's truly, and this is really the spirit of the Global Center as well, is that this collaborative spirit of vendors and companies working together um, to create these really innovative solutions. So you can see this, you're gonna talk, we're gonna talk a little bit about the power of the partnership of that. So with that, um, I'm gonna to introduce to you uh, Vernon Turner. And we're really excited to have uh, Vernon here today. He's the Senior Vice President of Enterprise Systems an IDC fellow for the Internet of Things. And uh, he has helped really drive research on the evolution of the IoT industry, um, really the next generation internet infrastructure, uh, which does include, of course, cloud computing, uh, converged IT infrastructures, microprocessors, modular servers, and data center designs. All of these really fit in the IoT um, name, you know, name itself. He's created uh, the IDC's leading Internet of Things research domain and is a member of the IoT World Forum Steering Committee. He's got a strong CIO-supported background in technology requirements of the finance and banking communities as well. And um, Vernon is frequently quoted in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, USA Today, uh, CNBC, and a host of other uh, international media outlets. Um, 
Last month, Vernon was named one of the top 100 influences uh, in IoT um, by a company called Analytica. So congratulations to that. Uh, so with that, there's a lot more to talk about with Vernon, so I'm going to let him uh, take it from here and uh, actually uh, give us a nice presentation. So a warm welcome for Vernon Turner, please. Thank you, John. So good morning, everyone. And um, that's a, quite the introduction John gave me. And um, let me get, put it down to little personal things. One is, um, for my sins, I'm from Boston. So the only way I can come back on that is to say that uh, we gave you an easy pass to the NBA finals. We gave you our only manager in 100 years to win a World Series of baseball. And the final thing is, um, anybody here from the College of Worcester or know where the College of Worcester is? My wife graduated from the College of Worcester, which when you go to the East Coast, everyone goes, you mean Worcester, Mass? And I go, no, a little further. Keep on going. So uh, that's a little bit about my background. Um, what I'd like to do, first of all, is just ask, um, is this anyone's first IoT event or webinar? I, congratulations, welcome. You are the newbies. Um, there have been a lot of IoT events and uh, a lot of hype around the market space. So trying to figure out how deep we need to go um, to make you fully, you know, fully aware of that. Um, the second question to ask is, how many of you are actually involved or up and running or maybe at the proof of concept of an IoT project? There we go. About third, two-thirds of the room. And anybody in production for IoT? You can put your hands up. It's okay. It's okay. You know, it's goodness. You are, let me give you a, uh, a statistic. Um, two or three weeks ago, I was at an event, um, a Cisco event, actually, and um, one of the things they showed was that 73% of all IoT projects started have not reached maturity yet or have, haven't gone past the proof of concept. Now, that doesn't mean to say that the other 27% are, are success or the 73% represents failure. I think it just represents that there's still this, mm, you know, how do we do this? What are we... What are we going to uh, do to get this started? So I think John uh, laid up the, the agenda today really, really well. And that is that um, it's a privilege to be here and, and be in this innovation center and be surrounded by a panel of, of, of experts who are actually digging the dirt for IoT and making something of it. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing their, their panel discussion. But from my perspective, um, the question I want to just pose to everybody is, you know, who is ready for IoT? And, and to be able to frame that, I'm just going to give you a little bit of the agenda. Um, you know, is this real or is this hype? Um, you know, what's the opportunities and challenges for us uh, out there? Um, when we think of IoT, we have to think about connecting devices. And we have to think about how we do that and why it's important to understand where those devices are and, and what they're plugging into. And consequently, when you plug something into a network, the goal here is to, is to generate some content. And um, I'm going to give you some mind-boggling numbers here. And, and, and without an IoT presentation, you would stand back and say, where do these guys come, with the, come from with these numbers? Uh, for example, the first one I'll throw out is, one of the reasons why I think there's so much attention drawn to IoT at the very beginning was the fact that... Uh, there was a report that went out there that said this was a $14 trillion opportunity. T, not B, T. And then it became a $17 trillion opportunity. And um, as a research firm, which we, we dig under the, uh, under the covers of what technology has done, we size the technology opportunity as opposed to the economic opportunity, which were those other numbers, at about 1.1, 1.2 trillion dollars will be spent on technology to run IoT solutions by 2020. So that gets everybody interested. Everybody says, oh, <laughs> there's a gold rush here. And, and I think that's what's happened. But what I think we didn't do a really good job is, is to segment the market carefully. 
so that everybody was able to say, if I'm in the United States and I'm in manufacturing, or I'm in, and particularly if it's a process or discrete, this is what I want to do. And when you do that, then you understand what the opportunity for you is. And it may not be a trillion dollars. It may not be a billion dollars. It may be a hundred million dollars. And personally, I'll take a hundred million dollars any day. But the idea is to set the expectations correctly. The third thing is, is to give you a hint of where we see the business models emerging. And over the last year or so, um, I've been fortunate, oh, unfortunate, to travel a lot, uh, mainly on United, the bike club airline of the world. Um, <laughs> so hopefully no one's here from United or their family. Um, I, I do a lot of miles with them. But um, to you know, be, travel the world and be able to see a lot of the business models that are, are emerging. And in particular, there, there are two distinct models. Uh, and if you consider uh, any evolution of a long tail deployment, these two models almost capture that whole long tail. And we'll get into it uh, in, in, some, in some detail. And then just finally some wrap up. How we, how we see this tying together three or four key points that I think um, you should really take away and, and, and absorb into your own organization. And last but not least, um, these slides are your slides. Uh, John and I talked about it earlier, uh, and um, you know, rather than maybe taking snapshots of, of, and, and missing the snapshot as the slide moves, um, these slides will be yours afterwards. And, and if you have any questions at all, um, my email address will be at the end. Feel free to write. Our, our, our company is one that if you want to talk to the analyst, you pick up the phone and talk to the analyst. It's that simple. We don't have a triage system. You get right through to us. So feel free. Feel free. And by the way, um, if you have any urgent questions about the presentation or content that you can't wait till the end, feel free to ask. You probably hear that being an Irishman, I like talking. I also like gambling. Um, and I have two other, two other devices. One is singing. I'm going to let you guess what the last one is. Um, so please feel free to interact with me. I, it, it's OK. I think somebody got the idea of the last vice that, that uh, I have. Um, so when we think of IoT, uh, there is a lot of, I say, hype around it. And for the last four years, we have done a global survey. We've asked over, over 4,000 IoT decision makers. And they could be anybody in IT. They could be a line of business. They could be in the C-suite. Um, what they're doing with IoT. And what's interesting is, is that you can see here, there's, there's this thing that says, well, 19% are saying it's transformative. They think that's what if, in terms of IoT will do for them. And, and we'll get into that a little bit later, what transformation actually means. And the 24% 20, 20, are considering it. And those are the ones that are sitting on the fence thinking, well, this isn't quite mature yet. And, and, and when, when I see that, I, I love to push back on, on them and say, well, when you say considering it, is it because you don't know what the technology is, you haven't heard of it, or you're not ready for it, or all of the above? And what's interesting is, is a lot of it is that they, they know of IoT. They think it's somewhat of a journey, and an IoT deployment is a journey. But in a particular case, they're going from technology, from the technology side of looking at it as RFID, RFID you know, an RFID tag um, on a good that just simply says, I'm here. Or the second phase is this idea of a machine-to-machine -machine journey, an M2M journey, where there is some talk for that machine-to-machines. But really, IoT is this intelligent sensor and, and I will share with you the word intelligent, because that sensor has a two-way communication. Excuse me. <clears throat> that two-way communication may be with another machine, as the evolution of machine to machine, or it may be from a system, a system way that, that is given information to make some fundamental changes. And I think the word intelligence gives people on the considering side this nervousness about saying, mm, what do I do now? This thing is now intelligent. Maybe I have to do something different that I haven't done before. 
as in look after it. But what is really, really stunning is when we think about this, if you add the strategic and transformative, you have almost 70%, I think it is 70% of all the respondents says, we are going down this path. And the reason why I share that with you is it kind of debunks the idea that is it hype? And this means to me that this is on a CIO's and a CEO's three to five year strategic roadmap. And, and we all know, having been in the industry for a long time, the three years can be a long time, particularly if you're in the middle of a very large ERP deployment. It looks like your life is never gonna come out of that dark hole. But three years is just around the corner. And, and really, if you're not moving in IoT today, and you're in the considering phase, you're behind the eight ball because your competition is already out there thinking about it. Think about this. Seven out of every 10 uh, customers that we interviewed here have some IoT plan. Now, what that plan is, is where we're going to get to next. Now, it's great to be in this, in this innovation building here uh, because one of the things that we, we've done is we, we tend to look at IoT adoption and the way we look at IoT adoption, using this four-year survey we keep doing, and we're starting the fifth year in September, is to ask customers like you, are you doing IoT today? Which is why I asked for the show of hands of who's starting. We ask you, what are you doing in the next 12 months? What are you doing in the next 24 months? And trying to get an idea of where you are on your maturity curve. Are you at the skunk works? Are you at the proof of concept? Are you at the limited deployment? Are you at the management phase, or are you really mature and using IoT to reinvent your business? So that's what we, when we look at the IoT adoption. And what you can see here is, is really, I don't want you to look at the top line and the bottom line, whether with the dotted line in, in the chart. But it really is to stand back and say, here's what's happening in the private sector versus here's what's happening in the public sector. And I apologize if you're at the back of the room, the, the, the blues are a little hard to see there. But what's always interesting for me is, is when people come up to me and say, well, what's the largest opportunity inside IoT? Who's moving the fastest? What's the adoption rate here? And they lean forward and say, it must be manufacturing. Well, manufacturing is potentially the biggest opportunity. When you think about what IoT could do to change the way we make goods, the way we deliver goods through a supply chain, it's very, very uh, big opportunity. Interesting enough, financial services and retail, in terms of adoption and speed, are a little ahead of, of, of manufacturing. And, and by the way, the bar charts are in proportion. So you can see that when you look at the private sector versus the public sector, and you look at healthcare, utilities, and government, they are moving and moving well, but they're not moving as fast as we'd expect or think to the private sector. And if you just take a step back, it's pretty easy to understand why that is. So in the private sector, most of the data is your data. And you decide that's your intellectual property. And you decide what you're going to do with that, how you're going to compete. So you're going to move a little faster. Think about the, the changes in retail. Think about the changes, the changes in supply chain management and logistics management in the industry. And when you're in the public sector, that data tends to be our data. And we're very nervous about what we're going to do with that data and how we use that data. But of course, when you think of the public sector, there's, there's many avenues of IoT. There's our data as, as patients. There's the opportunity for asset management inside buildings and inside um, places like hospitals. And there's also this notion of, of comparing the, the public sector in terms of, say, like building management as, is, as you would in the private sector. So those are probably moving faster, but when it comes to the public sector in general, whether it be a smart city or healthcare or government, we have to take a little step back off the gas because every now and then we have to think about whose data is it. And, and I can guarantee you later on in the panel, we're probably into uh, that discussion around whose data really is it at the end of the day. And, uh, because it doesn't seem, it's not always intuitive. So, the top five IoT challenges. 
We have a question? So the question is, in the government sector, um, when you look at, at, at data, um, when you look things, uh, say, building management, is that really the government's data? Or, 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 or is, that some, is that a private entity who's handling the, the management of that side? There's a crossover. Yep, absolutely right. But I want to just use the example of when we say government, we have to think about different layers of, of opportunity. Is it the patient? Is it the facility? You know, is it the asset itself inside, inside say, a hospital? That's all. But you're right. When it comes to the building management, often that's, that's done by a private entity. Okay. Um, bit of a quick trick question here. Anybody want to raise their hand or guess what is the number one IoT challenge? Security. Security, security data security, analytics. analytics. Any advance on analytics and data security? Well, it's in reverse order. First challenge is, and I'm going to build these up actually, so you can see. So I'll stop playing with you a little bit. Security is always the number one reason why customers don't want to do IoT. And what you'll see here is, is in the blue I put security and privacy concerns, because there is a difference. If you're in IT and you care about security, is this, can I be hacked? And um, if you look at and listen to the news recently, you think IoT is going to open up vulnerabilities everywhere. In my tech, and I'm from the financial services industry, so in my, in my industry before IDC, um, I was vice president of technology for State Street and Fidelity Investments. And we would do wire transfers every day, multiple times, billion dollar wire transfers uh, to, do, to do financial settlements. And knock on wood, we didn't see a single wire transfer get lost. Not because we were excellent at it, but because I think we had processes in place that stopped people from getting at the data. So the argument here is, is when I think of security, I think of, of the ability to deploy an IoT device and not follow any procedure. If you're on the enterprise side and your, your job is to support an IoT device in the field, have we lost our mind in how we attach a device to our network as opposed to if it were a server or storage or network device? Just because it's at the end of the network, we, uh, we seem to have forgotten how to attach those devices. Now, there is a potential, and I'm going to come to this in a moment, about why or who might be attaching those devices that may not have the same discipline as the CIO. So physical security, getting the device on the network, privacy concerns we talked about earlier, who owns the data. The second thing is this notion of costs, upfront costs and ongoing costs. I think the argument here is we are still in the infancy of doing really, really good TCOs for IoT, because we're changing the way we're going to run our business. And we'll come into that as well in, inside the presentation. How you run your business today won't be the same way once you go down the path of running a very IoT intensive configuration. Why? Because the rules are different, the way you handle the customers are different, the way you talk to the customer, the way you talk to suppliers is very, very different. The second thing is this, is this ongoing costs. We haven't done a really good job at looking at the TCO. Now, again, when we develop normal projects, we typically have a three-year, five-year life cycle because we know what the business rules are. And that's why I think later on when we do the couple of business uh, um, cases, you'll see how the rules are changing, why it makes it difficult. And the last one is this notion of existing infrastructure. Our infrastructure was built 
for a certain number of terabytes, a certain number of servers, a certain number of switches, routers, you name it. Something fairly contained and possibly in a, in a branch office configuration. It wasn't meant to be this very diverse dis distributed network that we're going to see in the future. And can it support that in the future? So I put this all up into the following. G GRC, government regulation and compliance, sovereignty, big part, particularly if you're trying to sell data in the country or outside the country, um, particularly in Europe, if, you have, if you're looking at aspirations to be a, a global partner. And this last, this last one, this whole notion of how do I manage the enterprise? How do I manage this, this distributed system? Because it's not like anything we've had in the past. Now, this is one of my favorites. Who is driving IoT decisions? And what's interesting is, I'd love to get a show of hands before I show some results. Anybody think that the number one person for driving is the CIO? Wow. One person thinks the CIO. So who's driving the bus? See, now you're, now you're changing your mind. That's what you're doing. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. What's really interesting for us is, uh, is again, uh, the, the, the nice thing that we, we try to do is, is we base our assumptions on real data, not by intuitive, even though someone as old as I am <laughs> who's been around the block a few times would say, this is what I feel. It's nice to be able to get some real data. And what I'm going to share with you here is, is something that we found new in 2016. For the first time doing the global survey, we saw a new con uh, constituent out there. Well, first of all, if you look at the chart, is it the IT department? Is it the line of business? And in the line of business here is, is, is interesting dual role. It can play the part of a normal business CFO, C CTO, excuse me, COO, line of business role, but it also, it also could include the operational technology side of, of things. If you're in manufacturing, that group of, of, of um, professionals who run that technology. So line of business has a dual role. And then what's interesting is for the first time in, in, in the study, 40% said the C, it's the CIO, the IT department. 30%, actually I rounded these up and down so it's easy to remember. It's 40, 30 for line of business. And for the first time ever, there is a skunk works department out there inside the LOB that runs IT. And that's that 20%. And what is happening here is we have never seen that group before. So what that's saying is, is that somebody out there doesn't think that IT knows how to run an IoT deployment, and therefore is, are doing their own thing, and maybe going out and, and working with service providers. And that's okay. But if you look at the narrative, I say it's complicated, only because I, IoT ideation is still along the party lines. So if it's manufacturing, OT, they're gonna be the ones who come up with the ideas. If it's traditional enterprise, the CIO, IT. So that's where I say is IT has the majority thought leadership on IoT projects across the groups as a whole. That's at 40%. However, when the customer gets involved, when the customer gets in the mix, they are gravitating to the point that they're saying the business, the lines of businesses, are the ones that you have to talk to and ignore IT as an option. So if you think about this, at the moment, the CIO has a role to play, and I would argue will continue to have a role to play. Because like anything, once you deploy these things and put them over the, over the wall for someone to run, it usually ends up in the CIO's office because of governance, regulation, and compliance, and auditing. Um, but the 30 and 20 means that 50% of the decision making is happening outside IT. Why I say that is, that is if, if you're talking to customers or trying to find customers, you have to be able to talk two languages. One is traditional IT, and now line of business discussion. Now, 
I mentioned earlier that lots of big numbers about IoT. Well, here's some big numbers for you. When we think of IoT and connections, think about this. In 2020, we estimate 30 billion IoT devices will be connected to your corporate networks globally. And that number jumps to 82 billion devices in uh, 2025. He needs, you need an IoT sensor to get, oh, I'm kidding. Um, but at the same time, 44 zettabytes worth of data will be created from these devices in 2020. And that also blossoms to 160 zettabytes. And the text at the bottom says, by 2025, every billion devices drives another two zettabytes of data, up from 1.4 zettabytes in 2020, a 5% increase in five years. OK. So what does that mean for us in this room? Well, it means, first of all, if you can't scale your infrastructure at this rate, and this rate looks like this, by the way, 150,000 sensors per minute by 2025 get plugged into the corporate networks. I don't know how many people I need if I'm a CIO to, employ, to deploy, to be able to run my infrastructure if I'm going to deploy this. And, and that kind of drives me to the conclusion that IoT is going to require a lot of automation, a lot of systems management tools to be able to manage this environment. The second point is, and I put up there, um, if, I, if I use this as an example, the water bottle as um, a gigabyte worth of data, so to get an idea of a volume, the 160 zettabytes of data is equivalent to 160 Great Walls of China. There's not enough disk storage in the world to store 160 zettabytes worth of data. So we're going to have to make decisions about where and how and when that data that's created is stored and recalled. And that's going to be an interesting discussion, particularly when it comes back to this whole idea of governance, regulation, and compliance. Because if I have the ability to store everything, I have to make a practical decision about what not to keep. And that might come back to bite me later on, particularly if I'm in the medical profession and throwing away some patient's data. I'm just saying. We know what lawyers are like when, when you say, I got rid of some data. They might want that data someday. But you can see here there's two things. One is there's this absolute need for a cloud infrastructure. The second is that there's an absolute need for some form of intelligent analytics to make sense of that amount of data. Now, that data is going to be connected using some kind of protocol. And I'm not going to belabor this too much. <sighs> Except, draw your attention to this. Here are some protocols that we've looked at, 2020, 2025, using that same data. Satellite, you know, satellite, very expensive, but an important part of IoT, particularly if you're looking at mining, particularly if you're looking at shipping, if you're in some inhospitable places where the only way you can get data is through a satellite, very expensive, that's not gonna go away. The second thing is, that, uh, draw your attention to the short range wireless. And remember, 2025 is the red bar. So short range wireless is growing a little faster than the rest of the market space, as is cellular, and fixed connection is shrinking. The one that's really, really interesting is this notion of low power, wide area networking. And the reason why that's so important is because it will challenge the way we connect devices. It's gonna use, let me ask you this. Anybody here have heard of LoRa, L-O-R-A? So you can see how we're going to connect those devices without using licensed spectrum. Um, Zigfox would be the other one. A competing technology is narrowband IoT, which predominantly has been driven by the service providers as an on-ramp for their cellular backhaul. Now, the reason why I tell you this is because when you think of your sensors and you have these devices to connect, you're going to get some interesting dialogue between carriers, which one to pick. And if you're in smart cities, 
the cost to deploy and get connected is really, really important to you. And what we're seeing right now, and this is not me being an advocate for any t technology in particular, but what I'm, what I'm seeing around the world is that in smart city deployments, when you want to connect the trash or the street light or something that's, what I would argue, fairly simple to connect, but doesn't have a lot of intrinsic value, meaning the trash is says, well, the trash barrel says I'm full, so you need to get come and pick, uh, pick it up and empty it. That data point is fairly small, and I would, I would say has limited value. So the technology that they're going to use is low-cost connectivity, and hence LoRa. So what we're seeing is, in a lot of smart city de deployments, is massive startups of LoRa deployments except in China. So if you're dealing with China, it's a different story. It's narrowband IoT, and that's been sponsored by Huawei. Uh, and it's interesting because um, the, the bikes uh, that I see in, in the cities, I see some here that you can, that you can rent or, or share, are probably going to be using LoRa in the US and elsewhere, except in China, but you're going to use narrowband IoT. At the break or q and I can get into that in great detail, the differences, but just share with you right now. This is an area that you need to keep an eye on when you're thinking of building those applications, how you connect them to your network, and what that means for you if you're a network engineer. Yep. I'm sorry? That's in cellular. Yep. So the last part of this, before we move into some uh, discussions around uh, business, is what's happening at the, quote, edge of the network? And um, interestingly enough, uh, like IoT, if I ask you, there's probably 60 of us in this room, what IoT means, I'd probably get 60 different answers. Likewise, if I ask you, what is the edge of the network? I might get 60 different answers as well. It just depends what the application is trying to do. For example, if you are that trash can on the street, is that the edge of the network? If you're in the building, is it the edge of the network? Is it the last endpoint on your network. What is interesting, though, is the, from the survey data that we have, and this is fairly consistent geography by year. So this hasn't moved a tremendous amount. So we're fairly comfortable about the range. Remember that 44 zettabytes, I said a lot of data? Well, your peers that we surveyed over the last four years have said, we're going to process that data at the time of creation. So that's saying 40 to 40, in this particular case, 40, 40 to 40, 41 to 45 percent of all IoT data will have some form of processing at the point of creation. That's not to say it's going to end up at that point. It may get transferred back to the cloud as part of that protocol spectrum I showed you. But what it does say is that we, as in the IT side, really, really need to understand what's going to happen at the edge of the network with that data. Is that data secured? Is that data being analyzed? Who has access to it? How do I retrieve it back? What do I do with it in terms of aging? And what's happening now is we're seeing this, this interesting evolution of the infrastructure where there are points of compute storage and analytics being built, not as in the branch office spectrum that we have today, but closer to the, as I say, at the end points themselves. That's one, yes sir. Do I see the cloud? at the tactical edge. So, so what's interesting, and, and you'll see in, in a couple of slides, uh, a schematic architectural diagram. It's not a, if some of you who are architects in this room would, will tear, this, will tear my, my, my uh, chart apart. The reason why I'm, 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 I'm hesitating to answer your question as a yes, no, is that there are companies that are building, rightly so, computational capability at the edge for all the right reasons. There are cloud providers 
AWS in particular, that announced back in December that it wants to use uh, a technology called Greengrass and make API calls to the edge and be able to do, that's their way of getting to the edge. So that's the reason why I'm answering it that way is we're seeing Microsoft and AWS reach out and try to make calls to the edge versus we're seeing um, some suppliers here today and other industry proponents who are actually doing slightly different. They're going to be creating a presence at the edge. So there's, there's two ways to get to that data. Yes, sir. Yes, we should have a really good conversation on that. And you find my fifth vice. I like beer. The, the dangerous combination. Yes, sir. So the question is, are we have, going to have, if I get it wrong, cut me off, are we going to have artificial intelligence applications and capability at the edge? Um, I was at, in, I was at uh, I'm, again, we're, we're pretty unbiased here. I was at NVIDIA about a month ago, and uh, their um, GPU um, roadmap would suggest that they as a company want to follow that by having enough compute on the sensor at a price point that allows you to do artificial intelligence and analytics on that sensor. That would change some of your decision making. Correct. Correct. So this is really, really, uh, 2016, 2017, 2000, I'd say probably 2018 is going to be this interesting year when that technology is, is, is being tested by developers and application writers. But It would be. Sure, sure. So I, I'm going to take a little break here and, 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 and from the presentation and, and suggest to you one of the challenges I'm seeing right now. So we were on this, um, this nice cycle of going from RFID, M to M to IoT. We all got it. And then we said, oh, wait a minute, our marketing has, we need analytics, so big data. So we now have got <laughs> IoT and big data to worry about. No, 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 no. You, know, you need more stuff. You need IoT, analytics, and AI. And my argument here is, is that can we as professionals absorb that amount of change in that space of time? Um, that's not to say it, it won't happen. I think there will be pockets of it happening, but it just means that when we come to the decision makers, the lines of businesses are going to come to people like us as, quote, IT, and I'm being very general here, to say, which one should I pick? Because I, this is a lot of new technology that's going to change the way I, I design my infrastructure, number one, but change completely the way I, I run my business because of those three variables, IoT, analytics, and, and um, artificial intelligence, or go a little bit different into machine learning, thinking, and reference. It's, it's, so if you thought things were busy, they're going to get busier. So. Yes, sir.
so I think, I think we're, we're actually probably in violent agreement. I think in five years' time, I'm hope I'm, I hope I'm out of a job. I hope that IoT is, is kind of like Wi-Fi. It's just there. And those trust facilities, and we're probably going to be going out of time here, John. Um, I'm getting a thumbs up. You know, will something like blockchain, the next big hype, will blockchain and IoT come together and provide some form of a of a distributed ledger capability that locks down that transaction. I think the jury's still out. At the moment, blockchain won't work at the edge of the network. It's just not built for that. So, but in terms of where we are, I think this is only the this is only one half of the cake. I'm just going to get to the second half, and hopefully, and again, we can join our colleagues here and have some conversations. Um, so let's move. I said earlier, you know, an IoT is, shouldn't be viewed uh, or looked at as a point product or a single deployment. And the reason why is because it's going to affect the way we run our business and consequently why we buy solutions. And one thing I want to share with you here, and this might help answer the, the questions of where we're going. You can see at the bottom here, Product-centric companies focus on products rather than customers buying those products. I like to think about it as those type of customers, they make something, they sell something. They put it, in, they put it into the channel and they push it out. And they have no idea what happened to it. That's the very traditional business model. And that's okay. That has worked for many, many years. We're moving to this notion of a service-centric customer view where the added value by enabling differentiation from competition who don't offer the same experience. So we're providing services that our competition don't have. And the last one is this where I think IoT is starting to play. And these, these are, are, are some things that we're seeing evolve here. This ecosystem-centric view as part of this evolution of the value chain where we, instead of having the customer at the end of the supply chain. The customer is actually in the middle of it. And here, we deliver a managed customer-centric experience from design, build, use, and retirement. In other words, the customer is feeding all those points at any one time of whether we build more, retire more, supply more, charge more, or charge less, based on the fact that the customer has given us real-time information. Now, that's all nice and easy. And, and what happens here is there's this thing, we have this, we have this law, I won't tell you whose law it is, that, that says that the, the business value of IoT is proportional to A, the speed or the velocity, and B, the number of times or the frequency that that data is read. Think about that. If you create information and you sit on it for 23 hours a day, and then you upload it, it has a certain amount of value. That's the speed or the velocity that you read it. If you have to read something, say it's a telemetry in a car, and you have to do that every 10 seconds or five seconds or one second or instantaneous, the value of that is pretty high. And what happens then is that is built around an ecosystem play here. Not one customer and not one company can deliver that solution. And what happens here is, is when an object or people are independent, they come to rely on each other for survival to the point of when the feds change interest rates, and this is not meant to be a chart that you can memorize in, in the names, but just look what happens when the feds change interest rates, what happens to our economy, how many different parts of the economy have to be modified. Now, having said all of that, let me just show you the first of the two business models that, that we have come across. And you can probably relate to some of these. The first is, this, and, and, and by the way, we call them 1.0 and 2.0. That's not to say that, that 2.0 is better than 1.0. 1.0, in, in my mind, meets the long tail, the, the small and medium customer quickly. And what you can see here is you have the sensors, these things called gateways, IoT platforms, analytics, and some form of machine learning. But these companies, as you can see, are heavily siloed 
as business units. And what we start to see are, are some, of the, some, some of the characteristics of these companies. These solutions barely get past the proof of concept because of the silos. We think these customers are still in learning mode. In other words, they've deployed an IoT solution in a silo inside that company. It could be a line of business or it could be a business unit itself. And perhaps nobody else knows what they're doing. They haven't shared anything here, but they have some value for that information. Um, and I would argue that they're getting limited value from that whole IoT infrastructure that I've just portrayed here. Now, the example here is, and I'm not knocking anybody here, um, I actually know Sachin. I visited Sachin last year. He's, by the way, in India. And it's not the fact that I couldn't get an example in Ohio. This is, this is probably uh, portable no matter where you are in the world. So Havels is, uh, I'm trying to think, it's not, quite as, it's not quite like Macy's, but they make, I'll call it, home stuff. Whether it be fans, irons, you, know, you name it. And his, his task was, Vernon says, to be globally recognized as a corporation that provides the best electrical and lighting solution delivered by a best-in-class people. Let me summarize it up by saying all he wanted to do was simply connect these devices with some form of IP that allowed him to do track and trace. So what he did was he used an Azure, a Microsoft Azure platform for those devices. And he was very, very happy. And we said to him, this is great. You're up and running, but however, you only know this amount of, of information. Now, that's the, the quick implementation. Connect something, put it in the cloud, and track and trace it. Use it for asset management and monitoring, and that's okay. What you start to see is something a little more interesting, and that's the, if you consider the long tail that we typically talk about, this would be the top left customers, somewhat more demanding. And what you start to see here is, is that Yes, we have sensors, we have IoT gateways, we have the IoT platform to manage those gateways and, and the environment. But now we're going to bring in the back office systems. Now we're going to connect to information outside our organization on this, what we call this open data platform. And the reason why is because we're going to ingest data from other sources and enrich our original platform. A little more complicated, but a heck of a lot more increase in business value. And the one thing I would just draw your attention to is when we, look, when we think of these back office systems, we call them intelligent ERP systems instead of being dumb ERP systems. In other words, IoT through this channel here will change and update the back office systems, to, say, to um, roll a truck if a street light needs to be fixed or a trash, you know, a trash and garbage collection needs to be done or change the way the supply chain or change the way they have to, have to pay a customer. But you're putting the information into this broader system and you can start to see what's happening here. Most of the IoT apps are in themselves cloud apps. There is constant use of analytics and cognitive learning. They have the velocity and frequency that I talked about earlier. And this last notion of no code, low code developer mode is because of the speed by which they're doing it. And it's not quite DevOps, but it's, they're using DevOps capabilities. Now, what does that look like? That's, this is what I want to share with you, why this is an ecosystem play. You can start to see this world, and not all these players are playing in one particular solution, but I just put them up there. To sh if you go from left to right with the IoT devices, you kind of see ARM, Intel, Qualcomm. When you get to the IoT gateways, you've got Dell, some of its competitors. When you look at the IoT platform, you can see people like GE's Predict, um, Zively, uh, ThingWorks from PTC, several other major names that are making plays onto the IoT management platform. And on the far left, there's a big SI play as well, system integrators to do this. Now, 
The company I would use is, is Pitney Bowes, a um, hundred year old company that almost went out of business because of stamps.com. Very simple. They employed a company called Electric Imp that changed all those small, medium business postage meter machines in their small shops, connected them to the, to, to the web using AWS, and implemented a Salesforce deployment. The reason why I say that is that they went from a simple analog company to a company that's now delivering as a service every part of their business. And to be able to do that, they've had to change the way they organizationally uh, are structured. Those silos, those department barriers are gone. Big, big change, both in technology and management. And that's where you need an executive sponsor, such as a CEO who has that vision. So finally, I just want to say something. Um, I mentioned earlier about transformation. And what I'd say here is that uh, if you're not careful with IoT, and if you're not careful with digital transformation, and you allow the two trains to run in parallel, you will end up with a very confused company. Why? Because you have all this information that nobody knows who owns, and you have all this company that wants to transform itself, but doesn't have any information on what to do with the customer, what to do with its own itself. And that's why I think it's really, really important to have this integration between IoT and digital transformation. Anytime we see a, a DX, a digital transformation strategy, the first question I ask, what's your IoT strategy? And vice versa. And if you don't see or hear the customer doing that, then you're going to end up with single point solutions of IoT deployment. But for example, here in this real world, IoT drives digital transformation across the organization. Think about this at the bottom here where we have these products that are churning, creating services, affects the marketing, affects R&D supply chain, and this, this notion of the rise of the connected product. So my last slide is, is this is meant to be paintball. Um, I, have three, I, I have three children, two teenagers, and I know that one of them can write an IoT application in less than 15 minutes. I've seen them do it. And the problem I have with that is that instead of giving a at, you know, at a boy, my fear is that if they go into the workforce and are allowed to help deploy those 30 billion connected devices without having any means, we end up with a paintball look of how IoT is being deployed, a splatter of IoT applications. So the first one is to be able to bring this together is understand the possibility of a new ecosystem of partners and suppliers. There are some suppliers today that are still living in the product and haven't quite raised themselves to delivering their offerings as services. And this ecosystem between a connectivity, finding, find, finding carriers that understand what applications you're writing, finding IT which understands where you want to process your information, and just really looking at this whole thing will, will drive us into this whole new world of, of ecosystem. The second thing is, I think this is really underplayed. There is an IoT skills gap. I think that's part of the hesitation I mentioned earlier about the skeptics or sitting on the fence. Because of the change of the way we write applications, the way we run applications, the way we secure those applications, the way we talk to suppliers, we, the way we talk to ecosystem. There's a skills gap there. And then the third one is this, is this notion. We've we, we got to understand the buyer. Who is the buyer? Is it the line of business? Is it the CIO? They talk different businesses. But to be successful, you have to bring them into the room at the same time. And often, that's a rarity. Uh, you know, the, the, it's interesting watching companies struggle to bring the right people into the IoT initial discussions. And the last thing I would just simply say, invest in that DX or digital transformation IoT practice. Because if you don't, you will end up with a paintball configuration. So with that, I'd like to thank you. Um, my, my details are here. Um, I think we're actually ready for lunch. We're taking questions along the way. I'm going to be here at lunchtime. I'm going to be helping the panel. And then if you want, we can have more conversations. But thank you for your questions. Thank you very much.
There we go. Nice. Okay, we're just about ready to get back. Hope lunch was good. Good conversations, I know, I'm sure, at some of the tables I was at. Awesome. I'm still thinking about uh, all the things that Vernon said, especially uh, frequency and velocity. Awesome message there. Anyway, it was a fantastic presentation. So now um, I'm going to be reading a little bit. Uh, we have four panel members, and uh, I want us to all know about who they are, give us a little bit of background about them. So uh, to my immediate left here is Mike Makuchek, and uh, he has been helping clients shape the future with new product innovation for more than 30 years, and he's the founder of the uh, firm called Smart Shape, which is all about inno innovation, located here in downtown Cleveland. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, SmartShape is also a, um, a tenant in this building, the Global Center for Health Innovation. So, you know, he's got a lot of broad and deep experience uh, and perspectives. Uh, Mike enjoys working at the forefront of emerging technology and anticipating what the trends are. Uh, not that IoT is a trend. IoT is here. Uh, IoT is a trend just like the Internet was a trend. Uh, Mike is certain that a person with a good idea can change the world uh, and uh, with Smart Shape's creative process can really help make it happen. Uh, he looks for uh, entrepreneurial thinkers, whether within startups or Fortune 100 companies, uh, with whom he can work with to shape the future. So uh, that is panelist Mike Mikuchek. And uh, let me bring that up. So our next panelist is going to be Sam Oliver. And uh, Sam is the Enterprise Practice Manager of the in Internet of Things with Tech Data. And he's got over uh, 20 years in leading IT operations as Director and Interim CEO, CIO of IT. Uh, he has uh, also done professional services and technical teams uh, leadership. And he's a strategic thought leader in IoT, data analytics, IT data center, virtualization, and IT security. Uh, Sam is responsible for growing the North American and Canadian business uh, in IoT by identifying opportunities for business expansion. So that's Sam Oliver. Next on our list is uh, Jenny. Jenny Zambelin is a president of Avantia uh, and is uh, a serial entrepreneur who has formed uh, three successful IT companies. Uh, the current firm, uh, Avantia, was founded uh, back in 2000, is headquartered here in Cleveland, Ohio. And they provide information technology consulting services, and they build custom application software for clients nationwide. Jenny's lifelong passion is building computer software that makes a difference for her clients, while providing an environment at the same time for her employees to enjoy uh, and achieve their potential. Uh, Jenny is an enthusiastic supporter of Cleveland, Ohio, and is committed to creating, creating sustainable, sustainable jobs right here in uh, Northeast Ohio. She's got a long history of serving on boards of academic, nonprofit, and for profit companies and organizations. Business accolades include multiple Weatherhead 100 awards, uh, Inc. 500, and Inc. 5000, and top 20 women business owners in Cleveland. Fantastic. And the fourth uh, member of our illustrious panel is Ed Yenny. Ed is the founder and president of Logisync, uh, and they are located uh, here in Avon, Ohio. Logisync provides embedded IoT hardware and software solutions to leading OEMs in multiple industries that enable equipment, sensors, and devices to communicate uh, and be remotely monitored and controlled. Many of Logisync's designs are industry first that progress to full-scale manufacturing and deployment. Prior to founding Logisync in 1993, Ed spent 16 years working in the aerospace, defense, medical electronics field, uh, primarily with Rockwell International. Uh, during this time, he performed lead roles in systems, project engineering, and high-profile profi programs, such as the Fast Time Acoustic Analysis Sonar System and the International Space Station Program. 
Great stuff. So over the course of his career, Ed has received numerous awards, such as the coveted Man Flight Awareness Award, NASA's highest form of civilian recognition, the Rockwell Autonetics Engineering Excellence Award, and the Lorain County Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 2012. So as you can see, this is one hell of a panel. So I'm now going to uh, bring the podium back to uh, Vernon Turner, who's now going to facilitate the panel. So the, the, there's, uh, we have some questions and thoughts uh, uh, prepared in advance for the panel. Uh, and then at the end of this session, there'll be a lot of time for Q&A and uh, interactive. So uh, Vernon. So hello everyone, back again. Um, John, if it's okay with you, um, instead of having Q&A right at the end, yeah. would you be okay if we embed it into the, because I know, I know this is not a shy audience because I heard them talk at lunchtime, so I know they, they know how to talk. If we do that, uh, just make sure we the We'll do, we'll do. Okay, so one of the things I mentioned earlier um, was this ecosystem and, and partnership and what I thought would be really interesting to do is, is we build out the panel is for you to see how and why we got to where we are with the panel and, and today. Um, think about IoT and you, when you start to think about IoT you have ideation and development and you're trying to figure out where should I, where should I start? What kind of device should I be making? Is it a device I want to make? Is it a sensor? What have you? I mentioned as well, that there is an infrastructure framework. And I, and I quickly went over this very, very large spaghetti diagram that showed uh, the sensors, the IoT platform, the cloud, IoT, so, excuse me, IoT gateway, uh, I, the cloud and the IoT platform, and then the back end systems. And um, I would argue that there's two areas that are really, really important to IoT. One is the IoT gateway position, because at that point, inside, say, a building like this, there's probably several hundred sensors on each floor, and you need to be able to aggregate those sensors into a, into one place and go from there. Whether it be to physically manage them, virtually manage them, but at least you need a gateway architecture. So we thought that was important to have somebody here to talk about that, that core technology or address that core technology as as part of um, the setup. And then, of course, um, you know, how do you go to how, how do you implement this stuff if you don't have anyone manufacturing the bits and pieces for us? And this is why, we, we, again, we think we have an interesting panel here who can help us step through the, that process. And of course, um, this ecosystem—remember that that scatter diagram I showed you that said when the feds change interest rates, what happens? Well, this is a this is a complicated ecosystem, and you do need somebody who understands the landscape, who has relationships with IT partners and software partners, and, and I would argue even in the industry partners as well, and hence the notion of the distribution deployment team. And last but not least, uh, one of the challenges I said was, you know, how do you support this an ongoing relationship? The cost is, is one aspect, but think about this. Some of these devices, go back to my teenage uh, uh, daughter who could deploy one of these things and walk away from it because <coughs> she's gone to do something else, can deploy an IoT sensor which might be on the network for years. Years. And you have to support it. You have to give it software upgrades. You have to give it power. You have to be able to look after as, as a real important part of, of your infrastructure. So you need to have that capability that sustaining engineering operations and support. And that's why we have the panel set up the way I have it today. Now, uh, John mentioned I got pages of questions, and we can get into the nitty gritty, but um, I'm gonna bounce back and forward from you and look for questions for you, or if you see or hear something really important, just put your hand up and we'll, we'll, we'll get to you uh, as quickly as possible. But what I, what I thought was really interesting is, is one of the things that, that we talked about was this notion of complexity and We've got some people today that this is their first IoT event. So the question that I pose to the panel, first of all, is you know, how do you start, where do you start with an IoT project or deployment? I mean, we talk about 
Uh, first of all, starting small. Uh, we talk about perhaps going after the low-hanging fruit, but after that, would you, give, would you like to give the audience advice on, on where you've been in terms of starting an IoT uh, project? And, and Mike, you want to take it off? Particularly in healthcare. Sure. Is, is this on? Yeah. Well, all of my colleagues uh, to my left, they have the capabilities and expertise to really create a IoT devices and systems, but our role is, is really largely in the beginning of first trying to really make sure that we're creating something that, that is, uh, serves, solves real problems and creates real advantages. You know, we're, like a, we're more people-centric, uh, trying to understand what do people really need and want and markets of people really need and want uh, so that we're creating um, su ultimately, ultimately successful products. And then also assuming that we, we've identified a real uh, opportunity, and then how will we design it so that it's intuitive and easy to use? Um, from a, uh, a deployment that we've uh, occurred in the past, uh, you know, the past two years, we've had you know 50 plus IoT type deployments. Um, some healthcare, some manufacturing. I mean, they, they really cross the gamut. From my perspective, it really does uh, matter about how you focus the IoT project. So, as you mentioned before. You know, you know, a smart building might have, or a smart hospital might have, you know, 100 plus IoT uh, potential use cases uh, inside those single uh, vertical solutions. And then it really breaks it down to um, what are the specific line of business issues that you're trying to solve for. And developing those line of business issues, picking one of those to create a prototype, to be able to then build on that. Don't try to boil the ocean with, with IoT. That's the most important uh, element in, in, in certainly in, in, the, in the last 50 deployments. Um, as well as just the sales cycle. Get, uh, I guess get used to the idea that IoT deployment um, is going to be long-term. It's going to be anywhere from, from 12 to 18 months uh, before you might even see a return on the investment, um, <clears throat> as well as there may be some business processes changes that, that'll need to happen to be able to understand how you take this data that you currently have and apply that across your business so that you can get the most impact out of the, out of the telemetry that you're getting you know, from these sensors. And I think what we're hearing here is this is very much like any other um, IT project where it's important to understand the business problem, make sure that you have stakeholders lined up, um, don't make promises that are going to be impossible to keep, particularly when often these are pilot projects and you want to, um, if, if you're saying there's going to be a huge return on investment, make sure you've got that lined up appropriately and realistically. Um, and I think both Mike and Sam have uh, articulated these same things. You have to know um, who, who's the stakeholder. Is it a customer? Is it a patient? Um, and define those requirements extremely well, then, then design the pilot or the prototype that is going to demonstrate um, the success in that. And start small, don't overpromise, um, and make sure that you're building awareness within the organization, because the organizational change and process improvement um, oftentimes those impact people's jobs and you might find saboteurs along the way that, that would like to prove that you're wrong in, in uh, the value of these new initiatives because they may fear that their job is going to be eliminated. So not unlike other automation uh, projects that we do, it's important to make sure that you're lining it up the right way and socializing it with the stakeholder group along the way. I think uh, <clears throat> I would also agree that this requirements, this upfront requirements interval is really imperative to having a successful program. Separating what you can do from what you should do is, is a very important thing. Furthermore, separating requirements from specifications is an important step because in this age of hype, every day there's a new transceiver out, there's a new technology out. And if you're not careful, the technology can start to drive your program, and that's not what you want. You want to be very clinical in terms of what are we trying to achieve, what's the value, as, as my colleagues here have said. But uh, so once you've, you've got a good system in place to capture, maintain, and organize your requirements, uh, that, that's important. Then you can turn your attention to how am I going to implement those requirements. Because oftentimes what you'll find for a given set of requirements, there might be five or six ways 
to, to solve those requirements. And it's important to uh, evaluate uh, uh, the different solutions and make sure that you're choosing the appropriate one based on risk, schedule, cost, other factors like that. So I think that upfront attention to uh, requirements, tracking, maintaining them, because one of the other things, just like any classic project, like you said, you know, you have to do requirements. But in uh, IoT, one of the differences is everything's changing so quickly. As soon as you write your first document, the next day everything's different. And so it, it just makes uh, it all that more important to, to pay attention to that upfront or interval, I believe. So, so, so one of the things that I, I highlighted was the um, volume of data that IoT devices will create. And, and, and one of the, the questions, I, I started to push a little bit in the, my presentation was, who owns that data? Um, I think it's really important that, that perhaps the panel share their thoughts about who owns the data in their mind. Um, Sam, do you want to start off? Um, <clears throat> well, when it comes to the data in general, it, 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 there is some dependencies uh, around the data, uh, around the data side. So um, data in IoT is really where the money is. Um, you follow the data, you follow the money. Um, that's where you can monetize, you can monetize IoT uh, in that sense. That's where you're going to get the return on any investments that you might make in IoT. Uh, so it's important that you resolve the issue around the data and who owns the data because ultimately, at the end of the day, you want to be able to either mine that data for internal use or mine that data for external use. Um, and in the case of, of, of many IoT deployments, these deployments can be had in, in the cloud, in Azure, they can be in, in, in IBM's, in the Bluemix environment. Uh, Amazon is, is doing some tremendous things there. Um, whether that's your ISP, uh, who's providing your infrastructure, whether that's uh, uh, the cloud environment, who's perhaps uh, housing that infrastructure, or if you've got a relationship just around SaaS and you don't necessarily own uh, all the storage uh, that's in that environment. You're just leasing some of the information coming from some of these cloud providers. So those are, those are all elements of, of, of what can uh, create some complexities uh, in, in who owns the data. Uh, but ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, what you have to discern at the very beginning of, of, of the project not only is where your data resides, uh, but what, what you have access to and when you have access to it. Um, so if you do any kind of transition of, of data centers or if you do any type of, of move of company, be able to to uh, basically coordinate and collect this data into a different environment, uh, whether that's locally or worldwide, uh, it's really important that wherever you store that data, whether that's on-prem uh, or, or if that's uh, off-prem in, in someone else's uh, data warehouse, that you understand the, the, the data usage of that. Um, and that because the reason why that's important is because these, these companies, um, especially the manufacturing of these uh, sensors, um, they're creating their own unique uh, uh, intellectual property around their own sensors. And sometimes they're basically giving you the sensor, but leasing you the data. Uh, and it's important to know that if they're leasing you the data, the data that's coming from some of these, you know, uh, deployments, whether that's a you know, smart agricultural type of, of thing where uh, the information flows straight to the, to the cloud from a sensor right, right to the cloud, um, is that information owned by the sensor? Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, Snow, uh, 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 Toro has an uh, IoT deployment where they're snow throwers. Well, they, they enable the IoT uh, devices in their snow throwers, uh, but they want to give that information to the, the middleman, which is uh, you know, the Home Depots and the Lowe's and the, and the, um, and the, uh, uh, the folks that sell those snow throwers to be able to add their own services on top of that. So they're, they're leasing this data from the, uh, from the supplier. The supplier is holding that data uh, on and then essentially renting that, that information out to, to the company. If you're deploying an IoT and you're creating your own unique value, your own uh, uh, analytics on that, uh, it's important to know that what data, because, because there's so many different areas that data can flow from, it can flow from these already made sensors that, um, you know, they're, they're part of a parking lot or a parking uh, type of thing, uh, deployment, that telemetry may be something that you don't know, uh, but the information that it goes into, uh, ultimately at the end of the day, this is your ERP, uh, that may be at that point you, you can own that old data, but it's really it, get, it can, can get complex. Um, just note that where that data is coming from, what you in fact own, and what you in fact are leasing, are two elements that I would uh, explore. So, so I'm going to ask for a show of hands because you raised an interesting point there. At, at some point, do you think there's going to be government intervention on IoT data, the same way as you have on the 
Securities Exchange Commission when you buy and sell uh, stock. Do you think we're going to get to a point where the government says, here are the guidelines you have to follow when you create IoT data, whether it be a service provider or an integrator or the manufacturer? Okay. Let's see a show of hands. Anybody think? Is Big Brother going to come watch everything? So the argument there, sorry, in healthcare? Yeah. yeah. Any other industries, you know, you think that might attract? I think my teenagers think they want that for the washing machine. Yeah. You know, they don't have to do laundry because it's, it's been bought by somebody. What does the panel think on that? So, Anthony, let me pass it back to the panel. What's your opinion then on security, which is obviously the, the, the big thing in the room that, that we all either want to talk about or we want to run away from. So what's, what's the panel's Just to weigh in opinion? on that, <clears throat> it's important to think uh, in, in terms of not just data but the information that's created from that data. So oftentimes raw data can be processed different ways for different stakeholders in the process. So it, it may be the same fundamental data <clears throat> that's uh, served up in different protocols or different averaging or, or whatever it is. So there's several stakeholders um, out there for that data. Um, oftentimes, uh, we see this all the time, that uh, we always give up our, you know, anyone who uses a computer in here, you're, we're giving up data every day. And a lot of times that's anonymous data. So I think what we're going to see is authorities, whatever the government authorities or whatever authorities, uh, they are going to be laying claims to anonymous data uh, with the guise of, well, it's helping to improve efficiencies or, or energy uh, conservation or things like that. So they may say, well, it's your data, so we're not going to steal your data so that someone knows when you're home or when you're not home, how much time you're spending at work or things like that. But we still need your data in an anonymous fashion so that we can properly manage the grid. So I think those are some of the distinctions that, that we see. Mm -hmm. Right now, what we're talking about here with Internet of Things is not really, it's not really mainstream yet. It's not quite in the public consciousness yet. It's just on the edge. What do you think is going, and if, 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 if these things are any indication, there's going to be some kind of network effect. You know, it could be something as easy as, you know, in the 90s, everybody used Microsoft Office and people could exchange documents, the Facebook, the Amazon. What's going to be the catalyst that's going to get us to a network effect with IoT data, which is really going to be 
what drives everything else. That's going to what's going to be that's going to be what makes policymakers even aware of it enough to even think about regulating it. That's going to really govern what kind of applications it's going to have in the future. I mean, in 2000, nobody thought of such a thing as Facebook. Nobody thought of it until they thought of it, and that's probably the same thing here. So, what what, what do you think is going to catalyze that? I, I think one of the first things that catalyzes it any time you're dealing with commerce. So, if you take energy submetering, for instance, somebody is going to get billed on what that IOT application says. So there's, there's now an exchange of money, and so you know, regulating bodies step in at that point. So I think that's, that'll be the catalyst. Safety's probably another one. I think with any new technology, um, we're still at a point when it's kind of the wild, wild west, you know, from a sensor perspective, from the infrastructure and the enabling device perspective. You know, if you think about it, the dot-com bust was what 2003 and you know back then oh this internet thing you know but look today there's not a business that isn't um, you know using the internet for everything that they're doing so it just takes a while for the technology to settle down for the winners to emerge right now if you start I think to your point earlier Ed you know you better look at minimum viable products because there's going to be 15 new choices on how you could build um, an IOT uh, application before you're done with it. So if you make it a 12-month project, you're already going to be obsolete by the time you hit market. So I think one of the things today, until we see the technology settling down and some leaders emerge, um, we're not going to see that critical mass and the catalyst of, you know, everything is IOT enabled. Um, but, it, but it is coming, and the platforms, you know, the early adopters always pay the most. It's expensive, but then when it becomes mainstream, the cost will come down, and then you'll see, um, you know, more and more companies um, and applications uh, coming to market. So where do you think we are? Is this 1995 or is it 1975? Where do you see that now? Uh, it's probably 1995, but I think the cycles are, are incredibly shorter than they were. You know, what took 10 years before is going to take two years now. I don't know if that was the right scale, but something like that. I just have a, a question just with regards to, we've been talking a lot about the technology and the enablers and, and whatnot. I, I'd like to get your comments on the economics. Uh, and I think we, we touched briefly on this notion of the legacy infrastructure, right? So we've got all the new shiny technology that we can deploy and deliver great value, um, but we also have to somehow make that work in an environment that's you know, largely legacy based. What have, what are you seeing with respect to, you know, how companies are going about handling that? I can, I can take a stab at that. Um, from a from a channel perspective, what I represent is is sort of this ecosystem of of IoT uh, suppliers, ISVs, um, SIs, uh, resellers. The, this this group, this community of of uh, suppliers as well as as well as end customers really delivers a, an interesting concept around, um, really around the delivery of, of, of monetizing or, or at least getting an ROI on the deployments. You can go as far as, um, uh, uh, you know, providing insurance guarantees. Uh, IoT is all about predictability. Well, there's insurance companies that will, for large IoT deployments, uh, will, will provide some insurance guarantees that can be factored in to, to how you monetize and it's certainly how you, you know, get paid or, or how you get receive, you know, funds from it. So it's different depending on what sector you're in. So if you're an ISV, um, it's all about it's all about uh, SaaS. It's all about paying by the drink. Uh, in many cases, where they're 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 giving the sensors, but then charging monthly fee for the the, the telemetry. <clears throat> um, when when it comes to uh, the, the the monetizations of the ROI, you know, components of that, it's going to come from from different areas. An example um, when you when you looked up uh, and you saw that architecture of IoT, there are um, Middleware, for example, that's sitting on a gateway uh, that handles the telemetry from a sensor that goes to a cloud. Well, this middleware also charges. Uh, so every every time you have a, a piece of telemetry that goes through this or flows through this that the that a middleware handles, they're going to charge for that, or that you can upsell and charge uh, for it as a service, uh, you know, down the road. Um, cloud environments are also going to charge, you know, by the drink for each telemetry that comes up. Um, so all of these are opportunities. Um, but the most important thing, I think, is creating the new business opportunities that you see. And an example is, uh, is, in, the, uh, in, is in the energy sector. 
So rather than um, trying to figure out how can I, you know, sell more wellheads um, in, in, in uh, you know, as, as a wellhead manufacturer, um, it's about how can I change my business model with IoT in enabling IoT sensors on a wellhead that allows me to then source that, uh, you know, that device as a sensor or as a service uh, rather than trying to sell it, you know, a $20,000 20, uh, in a wellhead. Same thing applies to, to the smart metering, you know, that's in, in everybody's home. How can I deliver more value as a, um, either as a reseller or as a company like Excel Energy or, or, or any one of those that can downstream affect, uh, you know, the, the entire ecosystem. So Excel Energy, we're seeing models where um, they're delivering, just like in the snow thrower uh, a case with Toro, where they're delivering an ecosystem that then down road uh, vendors can take, take advantage of. So it, it does depend on, on where you, <clears throat> sort of where, where you fit into the IoT ecosystem, whether you're that far left hand side with the sensors or if you're in the analytics side uh, with, uh, uh, you know, where the data uh, goes and then how you read that data can also be then monetized as well. I was going to say to that uh, same question uh, regarding the legacy handcuffs and the ROI challenges, it seems that in, in the work that we do with big and small startup companies, it, it shifts some of the opportunity to startup companies that don't have those uh, ROI equation challenges, and, and so it creates a lot of, lot of opportunity for disruption. And I think, you know, to your question about legacy systems, that's one of the obstacles is what do we do with the data? Our back-end ERP systems, say, for example, in healthcare, if your clinical systems, um, you can't take the data in from a connected device or from an IoT-type system, uh, then there's some constraints on how you can roll these applications out. So it, it is a big consideration, and it's going to require changes on the, the back-end uh, systems were that are the system of record for that sort of data. If I could weigh, if I could weigh in on that one also. <clears throat> Obviously, if you're a designer, if you're an OEM designing a new product right now, you ought to be thinking about communications, how that product sits into the whole, how it interacts with everything around it. And if you're not thinking about that and you're not designing that way, then you're probably not going to be a company in the in the future. But to your point, how do, you, how do you deal with all those legacy components out there? There are forges and presses and things that have been shipped in the you know, 30s, 40s, and 50s, and they're sitting out there as orphaned devices that have a very real impact on the profitability of the enterprise, uh, the efficiency of the enterprise, and everything else. So there's a whole class of you know, hardware and software adapters out there that uh, become an on-ramp, if you will, uh, to bring those, uh, those devices in. But um, very, very quickly, obviously, it, it then migrates to the problem uh, that the panel members are talking about here. What do you do with that data? But, but there, there has to be an easy way to get these devices onto the network first, because then you can learn what you don't know. So, so is, is one of the, the, the challenges interoperability? And associated with that, then, is there a lack of IoT standards? And, and if, if so, from what you've done so far, how do we address that, if, that, if that's a problem? One of the first companies <clears throat> that really addressed this was a company named uh, Echelon Corporation, which still exists. The founding CEO of, of Apple Computer, Mike Markala, developed a company with this very idea about de device connectivity and interoperability in mind. Unfortunately, that was proprietary, so it didn't catch on to be the industry standard. And over the years, several have come along. There are various committees working on these standards, but like anything else, it will likely be years before they kind of shake out into a, a one standard. We'll end up with, you know, say there's 70 standards, then they'll come down to 10 standards, then there'll be five standards, and then everyone will kind of work with those. To work off the paintball earlier, we are we are painting with paintballs now, uh, and over those next couple of years, we're going to do exactly that. This is what we've run into healthcare over years: is way too much data, way too many different formats, and trying to corral it back together. What, what's a what's a logical evolution then um, when we have an industry now that is very very young, uh, and uh, people are rushing to create? 
these applications, H how do we see the uh, convergence then happening in the future? It can't be just driven by government and regulations. Uh, w is there a, a market space in there to be able to help to drive that? Because at this stage, five years from now, we're going to have a heck of a lot more data that doesn't talk to anything else and isn't similar to anything else. How do we make that good? Well, uh, let me uh, just jump in there real quick when, when it comes to data like that. I mean, I'll give you an example with, with the auto industry. Um, uh, everyone have you know, these, these cars are all, um, you know, modern cars since for the last 15 years are all enabled with, with data. Uh, the ODB2 connector that you have in there, this collecting information all the time, but none of it's really being stored other than, you know, other than maybe switching a light on that says you need to, you know, have maintenance on your car or whatever. Well, as the auto manufacturers are, you know, they own this data. They own all the data inside a car. And where we're going to see, I think, a, a convergence is where they start being able to, to monetize that data, so being able to upsell. Um, so they give certain data for free, like maybe, you know, the must data, like uh, you know, how much gas you have in your gas tank. Uh, but if there's anything else, other analytics uh, that you need from your car, uh, predictability analytics, those kinds of things, if they can monetize that and charge for a service, I think that's where you're going to see that convergence. It's really about monetizing uh, the, the, the data. So it's not data itself. I mean, there's a lot of dark data out there, um, and there's a good reason why it's dark, is it's not really, uh, it's not really worth a lot to, to, to the people that own it, unless you shed some light onto it, unless you be able to uh, turn that dark information, uh, or the information that you don't really know, and turn that into, into some monetized, customer-focused uh, you know, type of, of uh, uh, offering, I guess. So that, to me, is where, where you get convergence. You know, I think another, <clears throat> this brings up another point, is the need to transform data into information at the lowest point economically feasible and technically feasible in a system. Because as soon as that sensor starts talking um, in terms of normalized engineering units, things that other people understand, now it's not a foreign device. But uh, before that conversion, it might be a tw 4 to 20 milliamp signal. And that 6.3 milliamps might be 600 pounds, 400 degrees. It might mean a lot of different things. So as quickly as you can turn that data into information where other systems can then start to uh, operate on that is, is the better off you are. And I think that'll help fuel that transformation you discussed. You know, it's interesting. You, you raised the, the car. And I, I would argue that the car is the, the face of IoT for disruption whether it be in a shared service model, whether it be in a uh, disruptive insurance usage-based model, whether it be the dealership, um, if, you have an, if you have an electric vehicle, who owns the data? I mean, it's, it really is li lining up a lot of competitors who want that data. And, and, and the argument I make is um, we, we had Liberty Mutual, and I put in the uh, OBD, the onboard device, dongle into the car. And that, that was for me to try and prove to the, the insurance company that my teenagers weren't reckless driving. <laughs> I mean, I'm, still, I'm still paying. I'm still paying. <laughs> but, but the notion here is it goes back to the data. I mean, it goes back to who owns the data. And I would argue that the car industry is, is potentially the window when we look and say, how will this go in the future? Because I think it brings in a lot of adjacent industries. And that's where I think the standards, being able to, to share that information, is really important for, for, for both partners. And if one says, I own the data, then I think we're going to end up with a complete war. It'll end up in court. I think that's going to happen. That's, that's my unfortunate negative side of it. But the op opportunistic side is, is phenomenal. I think the way we buy cars in 10 years' time won't look anything like what we, what we do today. I read I think your the, contract car is going to be more and more important because it's going to describe who owns the data uh, in the contract when you, when you buy a lease, a lease a vehicle. So it'll be interesting how that transforms the industry in itself. You yep. mean I have to start reading those things? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, we, we have one scenario on the, on the insurance industry that says in 10 years' time, um, things like driverless and ride sharing will mean that insurance policy for me, if I want a million, if I want to drive my own car with a million dollar policy, I'll be the only one left, and it'll cost me a million dollars because there's no one else to share the risk. So be careful what we ask for. Um, any other questions before I go back to the audience? Oh. 
Ed, this question is kind of for you. We've, we've talked about the Internet of Things, the, the number of sensors, the number of data, the, the infrastructure to go to 80 zillion, trillion, whatever uh, bits of data. There's, isn't there an inherent problem right now in these conversions where people like you have to deal with how many people are out there to go ahead and actually develop the firmware, not so much the software, to integrate all these devices? And do we have that infrastructure or engineering capability right now within the, the what we're talking about with these levels of expansion? I, I'm not sure I... Sure, I completely understood the question about uh, about the capability to develop skills, firmware skills, at the device skills. level. Right, clearly it's, it's where the rubber meets the road. And so a whole, I, the thing about an IoT program, uh, if any one of our companies don't deliver on our piece of it, the whole program fails. So if, if the unit that gets designed that has the sensors on it and the service technician is carrying, if they don't like to pick it up and carry it and it's not well balanced and things like that, then that program's going to fail. Similarly, if on the business end there's a problem, then the program's gonna fail. Or if you can't manufacture, it's gonna fail. So the rubber meets the road there at the, at the, at the firmware. A lot of times, legacy IoT devices that are being brought into a network are, are being brought in based on interfaces that were never intended to be networked. A good engineer put a serial interface on a piece of equipment because they needed to test that piece of equipment. And then somebody shipped hundreds of thousands of these units. And then someday you say, well, we want to bring these into the, into the network now. So that test interface now went from something that was just a test interface to something else. So it, it is very much a challenge on how do you bolt on some kind of an adapter uh, write software with multiple levels around it that increase the reliability and robustness of that communications interface. Furthermore, build it up into information, take it from data up into information, then wrap, you know, communication protocols and security around it. So it's a, it's a huge task just to get this equipment into it, and I'm glad you recognized that. <clears throat> one, one example I'll, I'll bring into uh, to that uh, with elevators. Um, elevators have been around for, you know, I don't know however long they've been around, uh, for a long time. Uh, and most of the elevators are, uh, don't really have IoT deployed in them. Um, they don't really have, uh, you know, sensors that, just like you said, described, they're not really designed to, to, uh, to be sent out and, and, and you know, put into a, into a database. They're designed for a technician to come in when the elevator breaks, plugs it in, figures out what's, what's wrong with it, much like the ODB2 connector on your car. Uh, but they, in, in, in a recent deployment that we had uh, in Europe, where we're retrofitting um, thousands, tens of thousands of elevators across Europe uh, in, in this case. So we're taking, they, they make them, they're little adapters that, they, that you can sell, and it's a, it's a matter of taking that serial connection, the analog feed that's, that feeds into them, digitize it, and then send that via Bluemix. Relatively simple uh, process. So number one, um, to me, that, that type of, of, of legacy deployment is the lowest hanging fruit in IoT. Being able to go after those those small uh, manufacturers that have, uh, you know, manufacturing um, uh, facilities that are that are you know, uh, uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years old kind of thing, where you can Im implement and deploy uh, IoT and retrofit a lot of the equipment that currently has the capability of collecting uh, information, but doesn't have the capability to transmit. Um, so it's not a complete. Uh, overhaul of, of, of the infrastructure to deploy IoT. It can be a, a simple matter of, of adapting and then just utilizing the existing data. Yeah, over here, I have a, a question. How are you uh, seeing the shifts on business networks and business models with IoT now that all this uh, data can flow uh, in a frictionless manner? There's a lot of talk about how blockchain plus IIoT is really going to disrupt things. Are you going to see Things like uh, the role of a distributor going away. Uh, are you guys? You guys are on the forefront of this. What uh, kind of macro trends are you seeing as a result of this around business networks and models that we need to keep an eye on? 
Well, from a from a uh, ecosystem perspective, I think there 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 definitely is a role for distribution um, as an aggregator, as a collector of all of this infor, uh, of information infrastructure around IoT. Um, as as uh, uh, as I've said this, you know, many many times, IoT really isn't a product; um, it's an ecosystem. Um, there's not a single thing, there's not a single partnership um, that can deploy IoT from from end to end. Uh, so, really, to me, that um, that uh, uh, that ecosystem is going to be important and who you partner with to make sure that the ISV product that you have that's, you know, maybe specific to parking lots, it talks that telemetry can talk to, you know, your P system, make sure these things are interoperable, uh, make sure these, um, uh, from a network, networking engineering perspective, um, uh, additional training. I mean, you've probably have seen some of the terminology uh, in, the, in the slideshow uh, this morning. Um, these, are, these are terms that network engineers probably never heard of. Uh, and it is a, it is that sensor world is a, uh, and and the way that information uh, 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 is sent from from sensor to gateway or sensor to cloud is completely different uh, than you would in a in a in a networked environment. However, those network engineers are the ones that are going to be at the ground level, understanding how this is all going to connect, how it's all going to be secured. So they play an important role. I just think that they're going to have to adapt to. Um, probably deeper into that sensor side, being able to understand how that information is being sent and transmitted uh, so they can take advantage of it. I think another big change when, when you think about the way we build um, the software side, the, the business application that's looking at that data and making it, um, you know, making decisions on it, moving from the way we wrote code before to more of a microservices architecture where you're moving the process to the data instead of operating on a big you know, database full of information, um, having real-time microservices that are doing things based on um, the data that's coming in, that, that's a huge change in architecture and the way we build the applications. Obviously, there's, there's an ability to transform business models. We talked about that this morning where someone can be selling a traditional product and before you know it, now they're in the business of selling the service. But one of the things we haven't talked about a lot here today is the ability for older companies to be able to uh, kind of put a new face on, on brands. So they may have a number of old products that have been designed over decades. They don't even look the same. They may not be the same colors. It may not have the same industrial design in terms of shape of the enclosures and things like that. But by being able to enable these devices with communications and smart applications and give them a user interface and a user experience that is common, all of a sudden this box of odds and ends all of a sudden looks the same. It starts to strengthen and reinforce a brand. And that's something that's never really been as easy and as possible up until now. Uh, that's one of the promises I think that IoT brings. Similarly, you could use that to distinguish and separate a brand. So let's say you were a company that had a portfolio of companies. You might look at those 12 companies that you may have and, you know, and say, you know, six of them or seven of them can use this same framework, this same solution. We're going to build it one way and we're going to skin it a different way for each one of those companies to strengthen and re reinforce the brand. So it may be the same technology underneath, but it looks very different as far as the customer and the user experience goes. Uh, quick question on the consumerism end. So I think we've addressed you know, a number of things. We looked at all the benefits that it can have for the individuals. Um, and we've talked about regulatory bodies and the regulation. Um, but how do you make sure that you're engaging the individuals and the end users so that as they're, they're coming along, I mean, everybody in this room is on board, right? I mean, I, IoT is something everyone's excited about. Um, but for the large, you know, sectors of the population where maybe they don't want certain pieces being tracked or certain things being followed or, you know, it, it's intimidating to them. As this grows, the importance of all the small parts working together is important. How do you kind of ensure that, that they become involved and engaged throughout it? We're all scared of Skynet. You know, maybe maybe just to respond, the short answer to your, your your question there is, if you've done a good job on the requirements, 
where you make a compelling business case and a reason we have to do this, by, by virtue of that, I think everybody will get pulled in because the choice is do this or become a dinosaur. And that seems pretty compelling. Good, good point. It, then it becomes an answer, it, same as Apple did. You just make it a beautiful user experience. So it, it's really all about, I mean, we've all used complicated systems that are spitting data at you, and you're like, you know, I just wanted to do this one thing, but I've got all this data and all these knobs and switches. I don't want any of them. I just want this one thing. So being able to, uh, to use the, the, the best technology that we have to create, you know, remarkable user experiences, I think, is, is what addresses the point you're talking about. And that's, that's by and large what, you know, Avanti is all about on the software side and, and of course, uh, SmartShape is about on the industrial and mechanical engineering side. I think the real answer is the market will tell you. I mean, you do your best, you get it out there, and then observe. You know, it, whatever you think as the designer, um, you don't know until you get it out there and then and get the feedback from the customers. Right. Ultimately, the market will tell you, but if you can you know, gain some uh, empathy with users through observation and get a, 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 a predictive, like look into the future of what the market's, go, try to really see what the market is going to tell you and, and then really do your best. But really it starts with understanding users, not assuming what users will use, but ob observing users, watching what they do, how they do what they do and then taking your best guess at what's going to make their life easier. And, yeah. Can I get one, one more quick point? Um, in, in, in a recent appointment that we had with a, with a dental facility, that very question came up um, where <clears throat> it really comes down to, to um, how you deploy IoT as well. Certain requirements, uh, you know, standard, you know, PMP work, absolutely, you know, trying to get uh, the best project management that you can and the due diligence behind that. But it also comes down to, with IoT, a proof of concept. It's very difficult to deploy uh, IoT conceptually. Um, there is, there is a, a step where you need to actually deploy it. And in this dental uh, opportunity that we worked, it was, what do, we, do we deploy it across the board? Do we deploy it to our 15,000 distribution offices across the world? Um, and the answer is no. I mean, let's pick one, small, make it small, uh, prove a concept. Uh, in four to four to six weeks, or, or however long it you know it would take to build a single proof of concept, deploy it small, and then just rinse and repeat as best you can. But starting small, proof of concept, I think is a is a surefire way to make sure that you get user adoption uh, as, as well as uh, uh, user buy-in. So, so we're we're almost at the top of the hour, but um, in, in the spirit of full disclosure, I sit on the the state of Illinois governor's board to make. Illinois, the smartest state in the U.S. Um, what advice would you give to the state of Ohio to compete against Illinois, given what they're doing, or they'd like to do? Panelists? A great question. Um, the state of Ohio has very unique characteristics in terms of our uh, experiences in aerospace, in defense, materials like polymers, uh, those kinds of things, our communications infrastructure, things like that. So it, I think from the state of Ohio perspective, we need to step back and, and really be honest with us uh, ourselves about what our strengths are and what our weaknesses are and play to our strengths and put together a program and a policy that, that emphasizes where we can win. I guess I would say the uh, similar, uh, you know, concepts with with proof of concept. Um, a lot of times, you know, we've had just just a, a conversation. Um, I don't know if it specifically applies to to, to this state or not, but uh, uh, it was down in Florida, uh, and the idea was how do we how do we utilize it? This was the question. It was really how do we utilize IoT? Period. And it really came down to sort of that ideation conversation. It's it's what's possible. So my advice would be you start out with 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 having that part of the possible conversation um, with the key stakeholders within, you know, city government or within the state uh, to be able to drive what, what specifically are the things that we're trying to solve for. Is it um, predictive? Um, is, it, uh, um, is it just analytics to be able to show, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, e either, either the investment that we've, that we've made as a city or a state 
uh, or is it is it around um, do we want to be able to to create a better you know quality of life in an inner city you know with traffic and and, and other things it's really I think focus on one or two key areas uh, that that uh, uh, you know really drives that value for 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 the uh, for the state and 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 go with that one area start small and then build it out uh, don't try to try to solve all the all the entire infrastructure I and mean, that's a huge uh, monumental task and I know that some states are trying to figure out how they get sensors on sewer pipes and water lines and things like that and it's it's daunting everything's buried and it's and it's and it's uh, it's a big project so first get some successes um, prove it out and then and then build from there uh, if I were in charge of the state of Ohio, uh, I would make a new plan that anyone who graduates from a university here with an advanced engineering degree or a PhD or anything, I would staple a green card to their diploma as long as they agree to stay in Ohio and not go to Illinois. I've uh, worked around the HVAC industry for a lot of years, and I've been in a lot of back rooms of a lot of different places. And you know, I think the biggest thing we got to do is we got to have a plan for the data because I've seen boxes and boxes and boxes and reels and reels of printed data and film reels and tape reels and cassettes. And I think at the end of the day, if we don't have a plan for the data, we're just going to throw away more of it in smaller boxes, and that's really what the end of it's going to be. He's, he's my 1% user <laughs> of using data. So I, I, I was hoping you could turn on a, a light bulb for me, maybe, if you can. You know, I, as, as we've just, uh, added some IoT uh, initiatives to our company, and we're, we're in the point of sale industry, but um, you know, we've, we've seen a shift from marketing driving the product to our knowledge center and aftermarket sales driving product, uh, more so. And uh, part of that has been very successful with adding uh, recurring revenue. So we're not getting all the revenue up front. Now we're, we're getting this recurring net revenue by adding uh, data for, uh, to our point of sale device. So now we, we know when you know, a customer, you know, hardware as a service, we know when the customer's using that receipt printer when they're changing their paper. Now we know when the box of paper is almost empty. We know when they need uh, supplies, that type of thing. So I can understand how, how we drive it for software as a service. We've done that. How we drive it as hardware as a service, you know, we've, we've see where the benefit is there. But, but you talk about this ecosystem uh, for IoT, and, and where's the product opportunity for that and, and point of sale? I just, I'm not seeing the light bulb there that, oh, this is the, the direction we need to be driving to arrive at this ecosystem for, for point of sale systems. And, and maybe that's true of other industry as well. Where, where, where is this, this uh, nirvana at? Or anybody. <laughs> I, I think it goes back to the who owns the data and what you do with that data. Um, Jenny and I had a conversation earlier about analytics and it's such an important ingredient of this. We don't talk enough about the strategy for analytics and, and where and how you're going to make advantage of, of that information. Because it goes back to the HVAC. If that just sits in a the box, there's nothing there. For you, you need to figure out what that information that you have, uh, what's the value proposition for you. So. in IP video surveillance, Axis and Acti, and we design point of sale opportunities where they have cameras and analytics built into their new cameras where it will recognize um, a customer looking at some clothes or a product in the store, recognize if it's a male or female, approximate age, usually within five years, and you could have monitors that will show video clips based on their demographic of what they're at, uh, wh where they fall in. So that gives the store the ability to market products to the person that's walking up to a clothing rack or a shelf that has product on there. And it gives the store to be able to market towards them. It also, there's opportunities where there's little cameras even at the register. 
um, that could show the customer if they're smiling or if they're frowning. Um, so you get feedback on their experience while at the store. Um, besides counting, uh, they, they, they have cameras that count how many people are coming in and out, and it tells you the hour, uh, the minutes, so you know traffic levels and everything. And they have the ability to change on the fly advertising in their store. If they wanted to have a, a, a flash sale, a two hour sale at a noon to two. Um, so there are opportunities with not only IoT, um, basically you could build IoT for any application out there. You just have to build the business case to have the value there and then you have to design it and architect it properly uh, so that it will uh, have an ROI for you and make sense. A uh, gentleman behind mentioned something about the, the healthcare and the hospitals having so much information in every department and there's so much they don't know how to get through it or how to make it usable data. That's where a lot of times in larger corporations you have so many departments where the number one thing that's the hurdle is communication between all departments and all levels to make sure that they're on the same page or if one thing works in one department, why isn't that used elsewhere? Or I hear a lot of times, oh, I didn't know finance already did something like this. Now we're on a different platform and it's not, it doesn't integrate or communicate with the other software. So create the business case and then make sure that it's, uh, the software and the architecture is built to perform the way you are um, looking for it to perform. Otherwise, if it doesn't do what you want it to do, it's just uh, technology that's grabbing data and it's not that useful or it doesn't return value. Let me uh, just add real quick to that. Um, as far as your, your, your question around the, the ecosystem of, of, of IoT, there, there, there are literally hundreds, 160, I think the last count of, of IoT platforms. Um, and understanding uh, the interoperability of these platforms, whether you're adopting Azure, whether you're adopting IBM, whether you're adopting a you know, homegrown uh, type application, it's really the interoperability. Um, and where, what, you know, part of my job for the last two years is to research uh, the, the ecosystem of IoT and to bring that into the channel and make that available to, uh, to channel partners and, and, and uh, uh, ISVs and other suppliers. And an example of that is, you know, smart shelving um, is, is, is a great example of, of you might have the sensor, but the sensor connects to a gateway. The gateways uh, uh, can be one of, you know, probably 30 or 40 different types of gateways that you can have. That gateway has software that sits on top of that, that handles that telemetry. Um, there's a, there's a uh, IoT platform that ingests that information. There's, um, there's uh, analytics uh, that then it feeds, uh, uh, that, that uh, the IoT platform feeds into and coagulates this information from anywhere from you know, IBM's weather information uh, and adding that to a, uh, to a store's information about how many you know, customers are, are, are coming in. Uh, we, we did a, we did a, um, a retail uh, opportunity with, with one of the largest uh, uh, national retail, and really all it was about is what do customers do when they come into our store? Um, so it was, a, it was a basically they placed a, a smart uh, mat in front of the store that allowed uh, that mat to collect inf foot traffic information. Do the customers go left, right, or, or straight? We added video analytics to see if there was a, a female or a male, and so they could then determine, um, you know, how many you know females go left uh, in in a store when they walk in the store, how many go right, and how many go straight, and so if you go into this into this electronics store uh, today, you'll see that electronics, the the sexy electronics is on the right, the the commodity stuff, the CDs and whatnot's in the center, and um, and the, the household stuff is on the left, and that was all determined by this um, this. Uh, uh, IoT project to, to just to figure out a basic question: What do our customers do when they come into the store, uh, and how can we organize our store? So, it all of these elements just led to okay, we need to be able to um, uh, adapt and adjust our um, our marketing strategy, where our, where our products are located. But a lot of this stuff was determined by the the IoT that was deployed: smart shelving, smart mats, um, you know, ISVs, and all this information had to be collected uh, and make sure that they're, they 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 interoperate. So. Uh, I would say that the ecosystem of IoT is as big now as it, it probably, well, it'll probably grow in the next few years, I'm, I'm sure, from a, from a product's perspective. Uh, but from a uh, 
consolidation we're going to probably see in the next few years, a consolidation of, of, these, uh, of these products. And you know, part of my role, part of, part of distribution's role is to help figure that out and enable uh, the partners that you ultimately would go to to help deploy, um, making sure that we pick the right products to deploy in, in any given IoT uh, use case. Um, thanks, Simon and Anthony. That's good consulting. Um, we're down to the, the wire here, but I'd love to get the rapid fire. Um, 30 seconds from each of you. Last piece of advice, last opinion for, for the audience today. Um, Ed, why don't you start? I would feel like if I didn't say this before we left, I'd be remiss. But one of the demographic shifts that's happening, uh, obviously, in our country is there's a lot of expertise that's retiring. And the need to be able to codify, organize this expertise, and be able to use that to train the next generation of, of uh, workers, technicians, you know, whoever's involved in maintaining our systems is really important. And I, I honestly think that'll be a very important role of IoT as we go forward. Lastly, I would like to say, I think as we look forward in this IoT business, we uh, are going to be in a society that, quite frankly, depends on IoT for our very survival when it comes to managing you know, the finite resources that we have in this world. The, this world is groaning under the weight of its inhabitants. And I think this kind of technology is, is the ticket to a, a successful future. Wow. <laughs> um, so I think it's an exciting new set of technologies. It's not going to, like all the others before them, won't replace everything that came before. It's going to get added onto the pile. And we're going to have to figure out uh, what makes sense. Um, if, you, if you start down a project, and you should, um, uh, do a pilot, fail quickly, fail cheaply, um, because the technology is still evolving and don't spend too much time or too much money to get a prototype up and running, but definitely get going on it and figure out where it fits in your ecosystem. Um, and it's likely that the, the small startups are going to become the leaders, like in uh, Clayton Christensen's Inno Inno Innovator's Dilemma. The big companies have a hard time changing um, what they do, and it's usually the small guys that innovate the new technologies, and then the big guys will make it sustainable. Well, I would say that, that um, when it comes to IoT, it's all about ideation. It's all about talking about the art of the possible. Um, um, it's, it's, if, if, if you've seen IoT, you're all here because you're interested in IoT, um, uh, and if IoT has at least um, if you take anything away from, from this session, um, is, is it, it can be as simple as you, as you really want it to deploy and to, and to think and to create IoT solutions for your own businesses. So don't, don't be shy about, about uh, um, asking, the, asking the questions or bringing in uh, a third party that can help you through that ideation, through what can IoT actually do for your businesses, um, and, and shrink it down to some, some very specific areas where you want to tackle first, second, and third. The one thing I would, I would emphasize is it's, it's, it's what I do for a living, and that is to not under, uh, encourage people to really be careful not to underestimate the importance of uh, creating a, a good user experience, an intuitive, seamless user experience, because um, I couldn't create a Internet of Things product, a smart connected product, with, without what Sam and Jenny and Ed's team do. I just don't have their expertise. But they could create something uh, without paying proper attention to the user experience, and then it, it, you know, it may not succeed in the market. So I would say that because you, that part can be skipped, that, that attention can be skipped, it, it sometimes is. Um, so I, you know, Steve Jobs recognized the importance of it. I'd say that you gotta, you've got to really pay attention to that. Well, John, I'm going to pass it back to you for any closing comments or remarks. All right, we went a little bit over, but we could have probably went on for hours and hours after that. So um, let me, uh, of course, thank the panel. Mike McCuchek from Smart Shape, Sam Oliver from Tech Data, Jenny Zemblin from Avantia, and Ed Yenny from... Logisync and Vernon Turner from IDC. What a fantastic uh, afternoon this has been for content. Wow. <clears throat>
really good stuff. <clears throat> in fact, it's pretty exciting. And, and in fact, I was thinking maybe in the future we reverse uh, the format of this and maybe uh, the audience becomes the panel and uh, you guys ask the questions and we go back and forth like that. That would be really interesting. Um, on that note, so thank you, audience. You should give yourselves, please, a, a round of applause for uh, <laughs> awesome stuff. So. Um, you know, I heard some comments um, before. We talked about uh, other events, Internet of Things related. And um, should we do this again? And I know there was some, uh, some thoughts about maybe basing it on data next time. And we focus. We start doing these events and really focus on some different areas like the data problem. Uh, and, you know, too many boxes and too many, and too many data. That, that was pretty interesting. So... Um, Show of hands, do you think we should keep this series going? And uh, uh, as far as, uh, excellent, thank you. Um, I, th I think we, we probably will continue this. And um, the format may change a little bit, but I think it's gonna kind of look and feel just like it is now. We'll continue uh, down this. And in fact, in the interest of um, uh, helping out some people, if anybody has any announcements, I'm happy to help them. Like uh, Bob Sopko from uh, Case Western Reserve, uh, he's got um, an initiative called the StartupBus.com, and uh, they have as, as a Cleveland thing, and it's IoT based and makerspace based because uh, Bob runs a, the the Think Box at um, a Case there. Uh, it's from July 31st to August 4th. Uh, the destination is New Orleans this year, and uh, it's called StartupBus.com. Uh, everybody in this room is within the age bracket, uh, and there's still uh, definitely time to stand up. So, uh, other things that are going on in Cleveland that are interesting is uh, there's also an IoT meetup uh, group in Cleveland. And in fact, we hosted one uh, here uh, about a year or so ago, and uh, we actually beat the heck out of beacons for an evening, and it was a lot of fun uh, with the beacons. Uh, another thing is you may have noticed that there's uh, some, you know, what's the future of IoT? Um, Rachel Miller, fantastic idea. We're going to put that uh, put that information together, and um, with your permission, and if you don't want it, please let me know. Uh, I will send out to everybody's email all of the ideas that we got from you today, and just share what the future of IT looks like and uh, see what we can do with that. The other thing is the uh, presentation that uh, Vernon so graciously offered. I will also, unless you want uh, a different way of uh, sharing, I will send that out to you in a PDF format um, to, on the email that you uh, registered with. So on that note, I will just say thank you once again for coming to this event and being part of this first of uh, uh, what is going to be a major initiative in our fine city and uh, in this area. So thank you again for everybody, and um, have a great afternoon. Yeah, I, 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 I